story this uh, week. Uh, let's see here. A local bookstore, and I think this was up, yeah, it's in Toronto. Local bookstore has sold out of a controversial marriage guide for Muslims. Marriage Guide for Muslims, Queen. The 160 page, let's see, a, a controversial marriage guide that advises Muslim men on how to beat their wives. This is real. The 160 page book pu- published by uh, Idara Impex in New Delhi, India, was written by Hazrat Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanvi. I'm sure you have several of his books in your, on your Kindle. Uh, who's described in the books forward as a prolific writer on almost every topic of Islamic learning. The store's manager, who didn't give his name, said the book had been sold out for some time. And the store's owner, whom the manager identified as Shamim Ahmad, uh, refused to comment for the story. It wasn't clear whether the shop... Has ordered more copies of the book, but it's available to online Islamic bookstores. Um, in the book's opening pages, it is written that it might be necessary to restrain her with strength or even to threaten her. Later, the author advises that the husband, quote, this is a quote, should treat the wife with kindness and love, even if she tends to be stupid and slow sometimes. Mm hmm. Page 45 contains the rights of the husband, which include his wife's inability to leave, quote, his house without his permission. And that his wife must, quote, fulfill his desires and not allow herself to be untidy, but she should beautify herself for him. In terms of physical punishment, the book advises that a husband may scold her and, quote, beat by hand or stick. Withhold money from her or pull her by the ears, but should refrain from beating her excessively. That's Islam for you. That's Islam. Uh, There was a case, it's stirred up controversy, there's a case, Muhammad Shafia, 59, uh, let's see here. His second wife... And their son were each convicted in January on four counts of first degree murder in what was characterized as an honor killing of four female family members as punishment for disobedience. Shafia's three daughters and first wife were found drowned in a car at the bottom of uh, Ridu Canal in Kingston, Ontario in June 2009. That's Islam. And I don't think we ought to be nice about it. Amen? Don't want it. This, it doesn't belong here. It doesn't belong here. I want nothing to do with it. We already have a good religion. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this Bible will never, ever, ever, ever tell you to beat your wife. Amen? Never tell you that. Never tell you to be dishonorable to your wife. Never tell you anything like that. It'll say, husbands, love your wives as your own body. Be not bitter against her. That's what the Bible says. The Bible will make things right if you'll let it. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I mentioned this Wednesday night. In my inadvertent lesson on 1 Corinthians, when I should have been in Hebrews. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, let's go back to verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Baptism is not the gospel. It is the evidence of the gospel, but it is not the gospel. It is not my goal in this church to baptize you. And here's what we're saying. You say, well, why does this have to be taught now? Because... The the new emerging churches and the ones that are changing everything, for some reason, they are placing a heavy emphasis on baptism and a boast on baptism. They will boast. If you listen to them, they will boast on how many people they baptize. uh, There's someone that I know of that um, I I see their correspondence on Facebook, and uh, they go to one of these community fellowships. 
And um, she was boasting on Facebook about the number of baptisms they performed last week. I mean, massive number of them. Uh, one church that uh, I researched down in Arkansas, and it was a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. People ought to know better. But what they did was <clears throat> they built a new children's church coliseum. And they decorated it in nice, you know, children themes and things like that. And they put a baptistry in there with like a, like a fire truck and this and that and the other. And when a kid was baptized... Then, it, I mean, you know, confetti popped out and a siren went off. And it was like a big, big thing when this child was baptized. Now, think about when you were 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. Think about that day. And if you went to a children's church and you saw some kid get baptized and there was this big party and balloons and everything like that. What do you want to do, Brady? I want to get baptized. Okay. So just think about the danger of this. That child, yeah, it is covetousness. That child will lean on that ritual that was performed on him for the rest of his life while he's sitting there next to a bag of marijuana or a whiskey bottle. And somebody comes by his door to try to tell him about Jesus. Oh, I got baptized when I was a kid. That's what's in his mind. There was no conversion. I remember, I remember the night that God saved me. Nine years old. And I wasn't looking to go down to the altar because all the other kids were going down there. It was at a camp. And I wasn't going, I wonder what they're saying down there. I wonder. I, I wasn't, and there was no confetti. There were no balloons. There was no clown giving out candy for all the kids that came to the altar. There was none of that. I remember that God was dealing with me. And I remember asking my mom, can I, because I, I mean, I wasn't sure, but I asked my mom, can I get saved tonight? And I went down to the altar and I remember crying, Wayne. Had a tender heart. By the way, don't, that's, that's what he means. Suffer the little children come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. If you can count on children to have anything, they'll have a tender heart. And let and if you can if you can maintain that throughout your life, that's good. But let God deal with you while your heart can still be worked on. Amen. Before it's too late, because we all get. And uh, there's some issues in life that with you, you are way past trying to convince. Amen. I'm talking about little things here and there, things you think about politics or money or anything like that. I mean, you're just way you're already way past being convinced that it's something different. OK, um, we had an, we had an old guy in this church years ago and I loved him. I loved him to death. Uh, but he, I mean, he got riled up one time because I mentioned the moon landing. And he said, we never went. And some of you are saying the same thing. I know. OK, and I just couldn't bring it up to him, couldn't couldn't convince him. OK, we get something in here that likes to hang on. And, and that's what he that's what he did. And that's how we are. So let God deal with you while you have a tender heart. But these children now in these churches, they're they're bringing people into the baptistry, into the baptistry. Hey, let's going to baptize you now. I'm going to baptize you and everybody. And they have all these baptisms. One church I had was looking at their, their announcements. And, uh, in fact, it was, you guys brought, brought my, it was Osteen's church, remember? They were going to have a baptism. Anybody wants to be baptized, come and get baptized. Where's the conversion? In fact, let's go, let's deal with this. Acts chapter 8. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where all the false doctrine comes from. Okay? A roadblock to false doctrine has been removed. Y'all know what a roadblock is, don't you? Okay. The police don't want you going down a certain road. They'll put a roadblock in there. Good morning, Jimmy. We're going to draw all of our attention to you as you walk in here in a minute. Okay. Check Acts chapter 8. Here's the story of Philip. That uh, 
went, uh, God told him to get up and let's get, we're going to have to talk to somebody. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He arose and went, Behold, a man of Ethiopia, and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, God did not, I just like this, God didn't tell Philip everything that he, was, he wanted him to do. He told him to get up and go. And if all you can get from God is one step at a time, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You need to trust that step. Amen? Don't move until he tells you to move. But if God says get up and move, then get up and move. Amen? And um, so anyway, verse 27, he rose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Where is that from? Does anybody know? Isaiah 53. Man, if you just ever just want to get a picture of the cross. Go read Isaiah 53. In fact, Isaiah 53 is neat because it's a perfect picture of the cross and it never happened yet. It was written before it ever happened. And yet there it is right there. Uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. In verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and went down with both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. What's the matter? I just want to point out that verse 37 is not in Well, it shouldn't be. Verse 37 in the ancient manuscripts is not there. Okay? So you don't have to. I just cross out verse 37. Is that okay? Why not? That's exactly right. See, I'm, I'm being facetious because I feel like being facetious today. I feel I got a little meanness in me today. I don't know where it came from. I mean, I feel good. Okay. But I'm just tired of everybody lying about God. I'm tired of it. Verse 37. Let me read it. If thou, he's the eunuch asked, what does he mean to be baptized? So if the eunuch was to go to these other churches, they'd say, well, come on. We're going to baptize you. Come on, now we're having a baptism next Sunday afternoon. We expect probably four or five hundred to be walking in the water. So come, come early and get in line and we'll run you through. And boy, that'll be it for you. That is not what this Bible teaches. Verse 37, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. See, I don't, I, you don't interest me in your rituals without belief. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith is dead. Okay? Baptism is a work. And it's, and it's a prescribed work. We're told to water baptize. Okay? Uh, but if it's not mixed with faith, it has nothing whatsoever. Just because you came to church this morning, that is not impressing God. Three, three church attendances in a row does not get you on God's book of life. You've you got to believe what he said. Isaac Asimov. You might know who that is. John, you know who Isaac Asimov is? He was a science fiction writer. He wrote I, Robot. Okay? And a bunch of other science fiction stories. Isaac Asimov wrote a commentary to the Bible. Whole Bible. Big volume. Isaac Asimov, he was a scientist and he was a science fiction writer. And he wrote a commentary to the Bible. And he never believed a word of it. Didn't even believe in God. 
Okay? Alexander, hang on, Alexander Scorby, the guy who narrates the King James Bible and all those, read the whole Bible, died lost. You have to believe it. You have to believe it, people. Yes, Jimmy. I'm, I'm going to be, turn, turn to 1 Corinthians 1, okay? Because I'm going to go back there in about three minutes. Yes, ma'am. I, I, listen, there's, every, listen when, when you take grace, the pure grace, out of the salvation equation, you will always add a work to re, when you replace it. Okay? And the devil, all the devil has to do, Kathy, is take one little piece of grace out and put a work in. That's all he's got to do. Because works is leaven. Works is leaven. You put just a little leaven in, and now and now we're puffed up with pride. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And that puffs us up when we think that we've done something to achieve salvation. And I'm just telling you, you see, all roads lead back to Rome, but Rome's got a straight line to the mystery of Babylon the Great. Rome teaches you got to do something. You've got to have something performed in order to be saved. That's what Rome teaches. And every doctrine, every doctrinal error that's going on right now adds a work to the salvation process. So when they, And these churches, especially the Southern Baptists, the Baptists are supposed to know better. And these churches now are saying, oh, just get baptized, get baptized. Now, they will, they will deny that they're saying that you can just be baptized. They will deny that. But we're not judging them by what they say. How, how can we judge them? By their fruits. Okay, you shall know them. And so, any, I, I guarantee you, you just walk in off the street and say, uh, yeah, I brought, my, I brought my three children in here. Will you baptize them today for me? Now, we'll pay you. I'll say, you know what, just take your money and take the kids to McDonald's. They'll be just as well off there. I'm not going to baptize them. I'm not going to give anybody in this church a false sense of security. I will give you a real sense of security through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I will not let you think for a second that any of your works are, are gaining you merits with God. Okay? Because... What's, what's all, what was on my mind this morning, this morning, before church, was I remember how bankrupt I used to be. And still am. God forgave the debt. But I haven't done anything. I have not done anything to merit the blessings that God has given me. I'll never think that, and I'm not going to let anybody else think it either. Okay? So he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He believes. He believes. Now, um, let's go back to, let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians. Back in chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And let me, let me throw this in here too because it's going to fit in with, with what we're dealing with. Because these people were marking down and attributing themselves under certain men like Paul and Apollos and, and Christ because of, because of baptism. And Paul is he's getting away from that. Now, uh, years ago, years and years and years ago, I was, really, I was just really searching for, the God, for God's will. And um, I, I, at one time, there was a there was a, a Baptist church here in town that um, that was looking for a youth minister, and I thought that's where God was going to take me. Okay, now let me tell you let me tell you the end of this story. Okay, God, when God says we're not going to do that or whatever, when God pulls on your chain, don't be angry at Him. You don't know what He knows. The pastor of this Southern Baptist church 
at the time was a closet sodomite. And a few years after this, he'd come out of the closet. Left his wife and kids and everything. Okay? God did not want me mixed up in that nonsense. Okay? He's, he's no, we're not going to do that. So, but I was, man, I was going to run to that hook, line, and sinker. And um, so we had a, me- had a meeting with the pastor and had a meeting with the, with the you know, these, these churches are real strong about boards. They've got boards for everything. And so there's a big meeting of the board men. And uh, so they're kind of talking about it and asking me questions and this, that, and the other. And finally one of them says, uh, well, we got the issue of baptism here. And I said, well, I, I was. I was baptized in, uh, you know, Bethel Free Will Baptist Church, uh, 1975. And by water immersion, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, it's not good enough. And I said, why? He said, uh, it says clearly in our bylaws that it's, we accept baptisms of, of like faith and practice. And he said, uh, you guys aren't. And he said, we'll require you to be rebaptized before you can come and join our church. Oh. Well, I'm, and I'm young, okay? I ain't but probably 23 years old, something like that, 24. But I, I slept on that that night, Brady. And I got up the next morning and I told, I told old Ron. I said, you know, Ron, I said, I hate to throw a monkey wrench in this. I said, but they're making me be baptized for their benefit so they can feel good about themselves. And I said, when I got, when I walked in that water there, that was a special moment with me. And I said, it means something to me. And I don't think that I'm, I don't feel inclined to, I don't feel led to. And I'm just saying right now, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. So that was the end of that right there. Okay. And uh, what I'm saying is, is that here in 1 Corinthians, they are placing this emphasis on, look at this outward show. Look at this manifestation. Look at this. Has he done this? Okay. And I'm telling you, that is not the basis. Paul didn't come preaching that. He came preaching the cross. You're not saved in the baptistry. You're not saved by church vote. You're not saved by the catechism. You're not saved by the, the wafer. You're not saved by any of that stuff. You're saved at the cross of Jesus Christ and nothing else. So he says, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And for it is written, and I covered a lot of this Wednesday night, but for verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know what the wisdom of this world says? The wisdom, I'll tell you how smart the wisdom of this world is. Wisdom of the world says you came from monkeys. And Sterling, I just about had a spell yesterday. I'm talking to this man over here from Holland. Way over there. I mean, that's the other side of the world. Okay? They talk funny. You know, you know what he said yesterday? He said... If evolution was true, how come there's still monkeys? That's exactly what he said. Did you guys go to the same school together? Yeah. School of King James English, amen. That's how smart the wisdom of this world is. They think you came from monkeys. Crazy bunch. Verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, I'm going to deal with that just for a minute. I want you to take your Bible. Notice he says the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I'm I'm going to address this very quickly. This is how God decided to save. How did the Ethiopian eunuch get saved? You go back and read it. Philip opened his mouth and preached to him Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't stand up in the chair and he said, let me tell you something, brother. Jesus died. But he didn't do that. But he began, to, he began to preach, he began to prophesy, began to proclaim Jesus Christ. Okay? And that's what he did. The words of the preacher. Uh, God dealt with me this one. Uh, go back to Ecclesiastes. When I get out on the deer stand, I've got a little Bible I carry with me. 
And uh, I've never, never had a deer season yet where God didn't just help me in a lot of ways. And um, you get out on the deer stand and you ain't got a TV and you ain't got an iPod and you ain't got this and that and the other. And so I just sit there with a great big bag of little Snickers bars. Amen. And a, an old King James Bible. And I was sitting out in the deer stand one day, and I just got, I said, God, I'm going to read this where you want, and just open it up. And it fell open to the book of Ecclesiastes. And right here it says the words of the preacher. And I stopped right there. Now, in, in my Bible, that's capital P. I know who the, I know who the real preacher is. The real preacher is Jesus Christ. We're supposed to say what he says. Amen. And it's the words of the preacher. And so, Brady, I just want to encourage you, anybody else out there listening, you think God's called you to preach or what? And by the way, uh, Philip, uh, Stephen preached. He was just a deacon. It is not forbidden for somebody other than a bishop to preach. Okay? And you don't have to do it like Billy Sunday or anybody else, but I'm just, you can proclaim the gospel. Preach to him. Okay? Uh, the words of the preacher. When we preach... Don't give them what uh, Whitney Houston said. Don't give them what Albert Einstein said. Don't give them what the Dalai Lama said. Don't tell them what George Washington said. Don't tell them. And that's what you hear. And, and there are some people out there listening right now who know exactly what I'm talking about. Because they've sat in these churches where the preacher gives out their, their three points. And they'll say, now, uh, uh, they'll quote some famous person in history and tell you what they said. I couldn't care less what they said. I mean, I could not care less about what everybody else thinks about the Bible. That does not make it not true or true. And see, they have replaced man's wisdom with God's words. Okay, they've taken out God's words out of, the, out of their preaching and they've replaced it with man's wisdom. And that is it precisely what Paul was going against. He said it's the foolishness of the world. God's not saving them with that. God's going to save them with the word. Okay, the words right here, the words of the preacher. So preacher, when you preach, preach this book. Give them scripture, give them scripture. And I've heard, I've heard good conservative preachers. They like to preach, they like to open up the Bible, they'll read about five verses out of it. And they'll preach for 30 minutes and never reference the scripture ever again. That's not preaching. You know what, and I don't care what you said. I want to hear what God said about it. I want to know what God says about it. So if we're going to preach, it's the, this is the words of the preacher right here. Okay? And then you know, you know Ecclesiastes. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But uh, he said, uh, verse 9, the thing that hath been it, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new, new thing under the sun. And if you just go through the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll find out vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And you know what it is that our job is supposed to, you know, our job as preachers, we're supposed to convince people that everything in this world is vanity except the cross. Everything is vanity. It'll pass away. And I'll even say this, even your marriage will eventually pass away. When one or the other dies, that marriage is over with. The only thing that lasts is the effect of the preaching of the cross in your life. That's it. It's the only thing that is not vain. And we're supposed to tell people that when we preach. That's why people don't like certain kind of preaching. Because they like to think that what they've got is special and what they've got is... is but I'm here to tell you, it's nothing. Can I get an amen out of somebody? You preach the cross. And so God decided that he was going to... Now, watch this now. Okay? Here's Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch is open. I mean, he is somebody that is wanting... See, you know what, you know what Christ has been doing with this eunuch? Been knocking on his door. Okay? And God heard that and he sent the preacher, Philip, to this man. And Philip got, got in a chariot because the man opened the door. Okay. Uh, there was a while back, Brady and Bradley went out. They went out door knocking. I think y'all do it again. Amen. And I said, now listen, there's wisdom in this. If those people, you can tell, you can tell when you knock doors, you can tell they'll open it like that. Okay. 
they haven't really opened the door. Okay? If they ask you a question like, you know, just something, you can tell whether or not they've opened the door or not. Philip had, or this eunuch had opened the door. Okay, Philip just said, I understand this is what thou readest, and this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, said, how can I unless some men show me? Is this speaking of Christ, or, or, or is this speaking of Isaiah or some other? He's opened the door now, and so now watch this, because Here, here's the common methodology that's, that's out there now. Uh, Philip, uh, Philip did not have a Christian rock concert in this man's chariot. He did not have his guitar slung across his back. He said, you know, I'm glad to ask you. You know, I wrote a song. <laughs> I'm a Christian cowboy. Right. That's a real song, by the way. I learned that when I was a child. Okay. And what was so funny was it was by a Japanese guy. He really he was a, Johnny Yasuda. He was a Japanese. He came over to, to study at the same college I went to. And... Um, I, I, I got, mom bought his album when I was a kid, and he used to sing, I'm a Christian cowboy. It was, it was real funny to watch this Japanese guy do it, but anyway. <laughs> Philip did not feel led to have a Christian concert in this man's, and that's, that's what you hear. That's what, that's what they'll tell you. Now, uh, Youth for Christ and all these big youth ministries, oh, listen, if we're going to have such a dynamic thing, bring all your kids here, you ought to see the music we're going to put on. The big musical show that we're going to have. And these bands will go around and they'll brag about how many kids they got to down front at the altar call by their singing. And that is not what it says. Now, I'm not against good singing. I'm not against uh, good gospel singing. I'm not against you using your talents for the Lord. But that is not the replacement for preaching. That is not how God said he's going to lead men to Christ. Okay? Now, we are to sing and make melody. We're to admonish the brethren using our music. We can, I, I, believe, I believe in all that stuff. But it's not the gospel concerts that's going to lead people to Jesus. In that, in that thing, Philip did not feel led to ask him if he had read Harry Potter. Hey, have you, let me tell you, have you read Harry Potter? Let me, tell you, let me tell you a little story. Philip did not feel led to come up with a myth or a fable, cunningly devised fable. He did not feel led to build a bridge between him and this Ethiopian eunuch and say, after all, we worship, all worship the same God. He did not feel led to do that. Philip told him the truth and he preached to him. And he preached the gospel to him and he said, let me tell you who this really is. This is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what I know about him. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I've heard. And Philip began to expound on him. And that's when they can, and, and by this, and here, well, here it is. Here's the salvation right here. The Ethiopian eunuch says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Can I be baptized now? And Philip said, if. Thou believest with all thine heart what I've just preached. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. At that point, he has already been Holy Ghost baptized. Cleansed. Okay? Then they went water, and they came up out of the water. That means they went into the water. Philip didn't take, hey, hand me that, hand me that cup over there. That's not what he did. Okay, But anyway, it's all about the preaching of the cross. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews' stumbling block and under the Greeks' foolishness. People, the Greeks, the wise people will look at that and say, oh, that's nonsense. And now what's coming out of the new apostate pastors is that they're, they're trying to make you feel bad for even believing that God would punish His Son as a means of getting to, a means of getting to God. They're trying to, make you, they're trying to convince you that it's not the way of the cross. They're preaching another gospel and it's cursed. God Himself curses it. So if you want to go to that church, you just be my guest. Okay? Uh, verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I'll say that in, in this context, 
the wisdom of God and the power of God are in the Bible. And this is why this Bible is such an outcast in every place around. It's an outcast in the world and it's now an outcast in the church. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. I covered that Wednesday night. God didn't call the Hollywood people and the Nashville country music singers. And even though these country music singers like to put out a gospel album, that does not impress me anymore. We will not put on Bible Truth Radio, Elvis sings Amazing Grace. Amen? I'm not doing it. Um, God calls the low people. Verse 27, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And I want to tell you, I just want to give you strong encouragement. The moment that you become nothing... God becomes everything. But as long as you've got a little something in you, God is nothing. And then it's all about you. And God had to teach me that. God had to teach me that hard. Okay? Uh, how does God teach us? I'm going to talk about that this morning. Uh, but God had to bring me down to nothing before he could use me. Why? Because no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Four things. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you're glad for anything, be glad in God and not in yourself, not in your own pride, not in what you have done. And, and God, here's what God will do for you. God will, God will just make it right in your life. He will absolutely cripple you. He'll ruin you. He'll devastate you. He will tear down everything that you've built up in your life. He will tear that down. Why? Because he didn't build it. He didn't do it. Um, already they're talking about the arch. You got to go up on the arch, didn't you? I should have told you that they're worried about that thing collapsing. They built it, it's supposed to last a thousand years, made out of stainless steel. Stainless steel doesn't rust. They're noticing rust on the arch, which means it's not as strong as it used to be. And if you got up there the other day and you felt it move a little bit, you get up on top of the arch and it, you can feel it. And it moves and jerks around a little bit. And that's the fun part of it. Okay? That's why some people won't go. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. God didn't build it. It's going to collapse one of these days. Everything that man builds collapses. Let God build it. Except the Lord build the house. They labor how? In vain. Vanity. Of vanities. All is vanity. That's, what, that's the words of the preacher. Okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for the cross and thank you for the book. Thank you, Lord, for salva real salvation. Not the fake salvation that everybody's selling everybody now. But thank you for real, genuine salvation. And Lord, Father, we believe you. We trust in you, Lord. And Father, when we decide to believe, Lord, your Holy Spirit moves in us. And all of a sudden we repent. And we just do all kinds of things, God, that we never thought we'd do. But, but Lord, it starts at the foot of the cross. But thank you for that salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation that causes us to repent. It gives us sorrow, Lord, over our sins. Thank you, Lord, for all of those things. And thank you, Lord, that at the cross, everybody comes in the same. They come in a sinner and they walk away a saint. Thank you for that. And if the world doesn't understand it, the world can't comprehend it, they think it's foolishness. It's not the sign that they were looking for. Then it's just too bad. Because that's where it is. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. When your kids are good, you hate to be upset with them.
I have to admit, <clears throat> though, I've been upset with my children, especially when they were children. And uh, <clears throat> I believe the Bible teaches corporal punishment. Now, the liberals of the world and uh, Dr. Freud, and I don't know who all else, I studied a little psychology, and I think there's some things there that are good. And <clears throat> You've heard people say that children are not born bad. They just learn bad things. Keith, let me ask you about these two boys sitting next to you. <clears throat> Were they born bad? Ah, now, hang on here. When's, when's the first time they told a lie? You, yeah? You didn't teach them that, did you? No, uh-uh. They, they had it automatic, didn't they? <clears throat> they may not be good at it. Okay? They may, they may not be as good as some others about it. But um, let, me, let, me, let me straighten you out a little bit on your liberal thinking. Okay? I, want, I do. I want to help you today, and I want to be a blessing to you, and I don't want you mad at me. But let me straighten you out on your liberal thinking. God, you did not invent children. God did. You did not create how their mind works and how their mind operates. God did. God did it. And you did not create the human body the way it is. God designed it the way that it is. And it's a very, very, and every part of it serves a function, doesn't it? Okay. Now, I do not believe, in fact, I get angry. There was a, a fellow yesterday, or what was it, yesterday I saw it on the news. They arrested him out at Scott Air Force Base for abusing his what, stepson or something like that. He got up and found cookie crumbs in the kitchen and went in and grabbed that boy, 11, 12-year-old boy, made him do over 700 push-ups, made him eat screws and all kinds of nasty, vile, wicked. <clears throat> that, there's the law against that, and there should be, and I don't think the law's tough enough. I'm not talking about child abuse, okay? But let me straighten out your liberal thinking, okay? God designed on everybody, on everybody that's alive has got a place here that's nice and soft and not dangerous, okay? Your heart's not here, okay? Your brain's not back here, okay? There's just a lot of fat. And a lot of nerves. Okay? And God designed that for that reason. And I believe in it. Okay? Now, if you're mad at me, you just be mad at God. Okay? Because God is... And I'm going I'm to say... I, I am. I'm going to say this for a reason. I'm, I have a reason behind what I'm getting at this morning. Okay? If you do not believe in using corporal punishment, you are ruining your children. You'd be mad at me if you want to. You can disagree with me if you want to, but you cannot disagree with God. Okay? Let me read you some scripture. Proverbs thirteen twenty four: He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now, God said that. I did not. If you want to challenge God on it, be my guest. But he that spareth his, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. You know what that, I had to look that word up. Me. You know what that word be times means? That means it's before the time. It means early. And by the way, if you're going to use corporal punishment on a child, do it early. Not only do it early in life, but do it as soon after the infraction as possible. You don't go back on a child after a year and say, you know what? I never did whip you. Remember that thing you did? I never did. But you know what? I'm going to do it today. <laughs> don't, that's not what this... That, follow the Bible. Amen? Just follow the Scriptures. Okay? Uh, Proverbs twenty two fifteen foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. You know what God said about a child? They are born bad. David said, I was shapen in iniquity and conceived in sin. That's what David said. One of the best men in the whole Bible. Realize it. And you know what God had, God had chastened him as well. He realized that he was shapen in iniquity and, and conceived in sin. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Have you ever watched children? They're fools. They do some of the foolish, like the time that I plucked my eyebrows out. Actually, I didn't pluck them. I had a little pair of little fingernail trimmer scissors, and I snipped them off. Because, I, Kathy, I couldn't figure out why nobody liked me.
So I thought, well, maybe they're too bushy. So I went out with my new look. And my mom said, what have you done? It's foolishness. It's, it was in there. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs twenty three thirteen, withhold not correction from the child. Withhold not correction from the child. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You listen to God now. If thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You're not going to kill him. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now you listen to God Almighty help you as a parent to overcome your insecurities of thinking your kids are going to hate you because you chasten them. Yes, sir. Is there an age limit? Well, according to the law, if you hit your child when they're 18 years old or older, you're going to go to prison. I, I would I would hang on to that one. OK, um, use the rod of correction. Thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. The age you're asking about age. The Bible says do it early. Do it early in life. Get them while they're young. OK, you straighten some things out when they're. Three, four, five, six, seven years old, you won't have a whole lot to deal with when they're 15, 16 years old. They will know the rules. By the way, children are designed to know that there is a fence that they cannot cross and should not cross. And when you take that away from them, you're removing just kids need boundaries. And if you don't believe that, when that kid gets out a little bit too far from mom and he's picking up on something that's going to hurt him, he's going to run back to mama's leg. And grab that leg and stay right there. He wants that protection. God is the one who designed these children. Okay? Not man. Not the liberals. Uh, the, the delivered soul from hell. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. The rod and reproof give wisdom. Now this is God talking. Okay? You don't, want, you don't want me preaching it? Then go outside and sit and go like this. And I won't be preaching it. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself, listen to this, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. How true is that? How many of you know kids that you're, that you're in your neighborhood that are being left to themselves? Mom and dad's not raising them. Oh, they're giving them food and giving them nice, giving them playstations and giving them expensive tennis shoes and giving them that. But they're not, they're not correcting their children. They're not correct. And you know it. You know the difference. You can tell the difference. Okay. Uh, you can tell the difference because they're going to get to age and all of a sudden mom and daddy say now something needs to be done. And that child will back talk. He'll throw a fit and he'll say, and you know what? Mom and dad now are the servant to the 14 year old little spoiled brat child. Those things ought not be. Listen, I'm just talking old fashioned stuff. Amen. Old fashioned stuff that we used to know in this country. So you say, well, why are you on this high horse about about corporal punishment? Because it's a matter of life and, and, and it's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. It is. It is absolute imperative that if we're going to bring children into the world, that we do it God's way and not the world's way. So don't listen to the TV psychologist and don't listen to the parents magazine and don't listen to the ACLU and don't listen to the liberals of the world. Don't listen to that when it comes. If they're going to tell you that you're going to harm that child and that actually it's better. And here's what they say. They say it's better if you don't use corporal punishment. It's better if you don't discipline them. If you just give them choices, they will make that. No, they won't. Amen. Give a child a choice. What's he going to do? Okay. Now, you say, why are you bringing this up? You're making me mad. Let me just tell you what's on my heart. I had, a, had somebody write me this week, and they were just, I wanted to help them so bad. I wanted to help them so bad. They were a long way away, and I just, man, I went to sleep the other night with just that, that person on my mind. And, and I said, God, is there something I can say to help them? And, and this is actually just what came about yesterday. And, and, um, but ask yourself the question now. How do I know if... God loves me. 
How do I know if God really loves me or not? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I have. How do I know if God loves me? If he really cares about me, how, how am I going to know this? And the answer is right there. I love my girls and I love my boys. I love them with all my heart. And would do anything for them. But I, I kind of had it in my mind when, when they were little that there were things that they couldn't be around. Things that they probably shouldn't be a part of. Things that they shouldn't do. And if mom and daddy said no, Lindsay, what does no mean? Means no. She'll tell you because when, they, when I'd say no and they'd say something else, I'd say what does no mean? Means no. Because if your children can't take you at your word, they're going to exploit you and run you and drive you into the loony bin. When they figure out that when you say no, you don't mean it. Now, I'm going to tell you, why is that so important? Because if God says no, he means no. If he says thou shalt not commit adultery, he means thou shalt not commit adultery. And God is not some weak, little, limber-wristed fell up in heaven going, oh, I wish my children would behave. I just can't do anything with them. God took a rod to their back. God chasing them when they wouldn't keep his law, when they wouldn't keep his commandments. Because my girls know, and my boys know that I love them. Number one, because I tell them, I love you, I love you, I love you. I tell them, but I, don't, I didn't just tell them. If they needed it, I'd whoop the fire out of them. We use phrases like that here in America. We did, I didn't say, oh, I just got done chastening my child. <laughs> What'd you do to him? I wore him out. I had him screaming. Okay? And my wife is going, you didn't leave marks, did you? <laughs> Not unless there's a medical examiner examines the body. Um, I wore him out. Whooped the fire out of him. Okay? Tanned his hide. Remember that one? I'm going to tan your hide. Okay? And my mom was the disciplinary. My dad never whipped me. My dad only whooped me or my sister one time. He only whooped one time when we were growing up. And that was my sister. And uh, he took a belt to her. About broke his heart. My dad was strong and stern, but about broke his heart because he caught my sister smoking a cigarette, hiding, hiding on the side of a house, not behind the house, but on the side of the house across the street, facing the road. <laughs> and mom and dad sitting in the window going. And he whipped her and that's all it took. She never picked up another one, hadn't picked up one since then. Um, that just meant it. That meant a lot to her. And she's thankful for that. And uh, but my mom, boy, she sure tore me up a lot of times. She'd whip me here to church or she'd whip me in the car on the way home or I'd get a whipping at home. Um, if I was at somebody else. And by the way, if, if the lady across the street was watching us and mom was out somewhere and that lady across the street had to take a belt to me and whip me. Mom didn't come home and go, you hit my child. I would go home and she'd whip me again for having to be whipped at the neighbor's house. And if I got a paddle in at school, if I got a paddle in at school, I got one when I got home. Amen. I, that's the way I was. If you got if you if, if that school teacher had to whip you at school, then you got a whipping at home. You got it twice. OK. When I was about 12, 13 years old, I went over here to Twin City Christian Academy. And they, they used corporal punch. They had a big fiberglass paddle. Okay, and that thing stung. And during that time, I was in the office about once a week, getting my britches wore out. <laughs> At least once a week. Because I, I had a rottenness in me that was starting to come out at that age. I mean, it was bad. Rebellion was just... And so I went there a year and a half, and by the time I got back into public school, I was in, a, I was in pretty good shape. And God knew what He was doing when He sent me there. And I'm just telling you, my kids know that I love them, especially now that they're grown up. My girls know that I love them because I was not going to be afraid of them. I wasn't worried that they were not going to be my friends. 
okay? And I took a belt off or I used my hand or Lisa trained all of our children to sit in church with a wooden spoon. That is not child abuse. So you get off your high horse. Amen. She's got it all decorated now. And... Listen, that is not child abuse. You get off your liberal high horse about this. Our country is not better because of liberality with our children. Our country is far worse. It is far worse. Far worse. We are afraid to walk down the street and face 13-year-old punks. Because we don't know what they're going to pull out of that overcoat that they're wearing. We are scared to death of children in this day and age. Okay? Now, why am I preaching this? How do you know God loves you? Okay? Let me read this again. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. How do you know if God loves you? But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. How do you know God loves you? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. How do you know God loves you? <clears throat> and this is what is in our hearts. And listen to me now. Because I'm not going to preach to a bunch of really, really good church people. I'm going to preach to some people that God has had to take and bend over his knee and take a rod to their backside and whoop the fire out of them over what they've done. That's who I'm preaching to this morning. So if that's you, say amen. That's me. I, I do not want to be a spoiled, rotten child in the kingdom of God. I do not want to be that. I have no interest in that whatsoever. And I have no interest in having a church full of people that are so spoiled and so used to getting their way. And let's admit, Mr. and Mrs. Adult, let's admit that the older we get, the more we like things our way. Let's admit that. Amen? Okay? And I'm telling there's nothing wrong with having a way if it's a good way. But if it's out of line and if it's not God's way, and you're going to be a child of God... Then God is going to take you and he is going to chasten you and he's going to whoop the fire. He's going to get the old razor strap out and God is going to lay it across your backside. He's going to get a rod after you and he's going to put stripes on you. Why? So that you realize that it's not your way. You just can't get by with anything. That God is watching over you and he loves you and he cares about you enough that he's not going to let you go and do whatever you want to do. See, the person that wrote me the other day, and, and I, I just felt for them that what they told me was that their life now is a result of a very, very, very bad childhood. And from what this person told me, there was abuse in that childhood. There was a lot of terrible things that happened in that childhood. And I feel sorry for that person. I really, really do. But let me, and I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about just being mean and taking cigarettes and sticking a child's arm with it. And I'm not talking about using an electrical cord. And I'm not talking about the, what this guy did the other day up in at, at, at Air Force Base. I'm not talking about that. That is mean. That's cruel. The Bible has, by the way, the Bible has a word for you parents too. provoke not your children to anger. You can be mean. You can be overly mean to your children. But if you if you're going to chasten and you're going to discipline your children. And by the way, God doesn't always chasten us for every little thing that we do. Sometimes he will use a strong voice against us. Amen. And so parents, raise your voice at your children. I said, no. Nah! Okay. You're not being mean to them. You're not, you're not burning them with, with names. And don't call them names either. But I don't like that. I'll whip you. Okay? I don't like name calling. You say, and don't say something that you're going to do that you're not going to do. I'll kill you! No. You, you know, just send a message to them. You don't mean it. So if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to threaten them, you threaten them with what you are going to do. 
And then if they violate that, do it. But you have to love them. You have to love them. And you have to love them honestly or you will abuse. Let me tell you, John, let me tell you what's going on in America. Let me tell you how good America is right now. Right now in America, our ladies are finding these boys sleeping with them. They'll live together for about six months or two years. And they'll pop out a couple kids. And then they get into it. Mama's going to play a little Jezebel. Dad's going to play a whoremonger. See, it works both ways. Dad's out of the scene. So she's got two kids that she's raising. Government's going to go after him for child support because he's a bum. He don't want to pay child support. So the government's going to go after him to get him to pay child support. Meanwhile, she's got somebody else moved in. She's got them in her bed with her. And she's going to pop out another child. Okay? And this guy did not, those two kids before that are not his children. So you know what? He doesn't love that. He doesn't even love the woman he's laying in bed with. He just wants to be in bed with her. So he definitely does not love her. And he absolutely does not love those children. And those children are just in his way. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to abuse those children. This is America. This is how it is. Right here. It's a shame that we're living in this kind of situation in this country. So I want to tell you something. You have to love them in order to qualify to do this. And if you have a child in your home and you do not love that child, you keep your hands off of them and you keep your mouth shut. That's thus saith the Lord. Okay? So if, you get, if you're mad. Okay? By the way, you know what this is, don't you? You're making a fist with your whole body. Okay? So if you're going to make a fist, make one at God. Make it real tight. God, I don't like your ways. And God says, too bad. My ways are right. So anyway, but this person was telling me, and they were crying. They wrote me an email, and they were crying. And I told them, and I said, I have never met you, don't know anything about you, but I care enough that when I go to sleep tonight, I want to pray for you. And I said, just think now at how much more God loves you. And let me tell you what I, what I think he was, see, he was just involved in some sin. And it was bothering him. He was crying and weeping. You know what God was doing with this man? He was chastening him. He's trying to teach this man that sin hurts. It'll, he's trying to teach him in a nice way that it hurts. To save his soul from hell. So that he'll know. <laughs> when my children come to me and they say, I'm sorry. Oh, I love that. Because if you make the child say, say you're sorry, sorry. Okay. But when your own children will come to you and say, I'm sorry. See, the beating's over and you're done being mad. And then you just love them. And so you know what God's, you know, it's, you know, parents are trying to do is they're trying to teach their children sorrow. Trying to teach them, they're trying to teach them that breaking the rules brings sorrow. And it hurts. And it's supposed to make you cry. And it's supposed to make you hurt. And it's supposed to make you think the next time. And I'm going to tell you, that one whipping per child does not go very far. How many of you know that? Who in here was whipped multiple times for multiple for the same thing? Jared, raise your hand. I know you're dead. Okay? You had to be whipped several times for the same thing. With me, it was grades or breaking windows. Lazy student. And every report card time, Gary, I got it. You know why? My mom said... You need, to, you need to have more of it. My mom, huh? You too? My mom did not, she went and got her GED in her 30s. Because she didn't finish school. And she wanted to make sure that her son finished school. So if I come home with a bad report card, I got it. Okay? 
take a Bible, turn to the book of Job, if you would. Father, help us to preach this message, and Lord, help it to be a blessing to people. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> and let me address this issue, because this is the issue that was brought to me in the email. And this, this may ring true with more than just one person, so this may be why God's dealing with you, okay? You got saved, and, and you say you love the Lord, and you're going to serve Him. Okay, that's great. Don't be fooled into thinking that just because you made this, this prayer commitment to God and God saved you, don't be fooled into thinking that now you're not going to have a sin nature anymore ever again. God wants to bring righteousness to you, but there's a way that God has chosen to do that. Number one, He gives you the help of His Spirit. But number two, God is going to use chastening to teach you righteousness. That's how He's going to do it. And so, and I would say, I would say this to anybody with any kind of addiction. It takes more than one shot to get it out of you. It takes more than one. Okay? As the deeper the sin is, the deeper the wound has to be. And the more often it has to be. But let me tell you something. God's way is always right. And at some point, at some point... You just get so tired of the chastening that it's just that, you know what God is doing? He's, he's training your mind to equal what used to be fun and what used to bring pleasure and what used to bring enjoyment and what used to bring all these things. He's conditioning your mind into understanding that it's not going to bring that anymore, that it's going to bring sorrow and it's going to bring pain and it's going to bring tears. And at some point, there's a little change in your mind because God designed you that way. And all of a sudden now, it's just not as fun as it used to be. How many of you know what I'm saying is true? Say amen. And all of a sudden now, you just, nah, nah, I don't, uh, I'm not interested. And the reason why you're not interested is because God chastened you into being not interested anymore. So tell him, thank you. Job chapter 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. I should ask, how many of you would like to be happy this morning? Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Don't despise God when he's raking you over the coals. See, there's another word we use. Raking you over the coals. Okay? Ouch! What are some other, whooping the fire out of you, tanning your hide, raking you over the coals. Whoop the tar out of you. Okay? Uh, how did they say it in Dutch? Get spanked? <laughs> Works? Let me tell you what God will do. Verse 18, He maketh sore and He bindeth. God does both. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. God does both. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven. He didn't just say once or one time. You get in trouble, and your mom or daddy have to spank you. It's not over yet, is it, Bradley? Because you're going to go get in trouble again, and God will have to... Whoop you again. And it's not over. You're going to go get in trouble again. And every time now, every time, you're sorry for what you did, but only after you got the punishment for what you did. Amen? But what happens is eventually, you're no longer sorry that you got punished. You're sorry that you did it. See how it works? And godly sorrow worketh repentance. And that brings salvation. Somebody say amen. By the way, I'll tell you this. God has never saved anyone who is not sorry for their sins. And He will not save anybody that will not be sorry for what they've done. You're going to lose your inheritance. God calls you, King James Bible, calls you a bastard. And no son, I might get to that in a minute. 
He woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven. There shall no evil touch thee. In famine shall he redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and with the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt know. Not sin. So those of you who are struggling with some sort of addiction, there's chemical addictions and eyeball addictions and body addictions, and there's just all kind of repeated sins over and over and over. God's got listen, God's got you get you didn't get saved and then do that thing that you promised God you'd never do again, and God's going up, oh, forget it. I took you at your word and you're a liar. Forget it. Got no salvation for you. Oh no, you've just enrolled yourself in God's plan. Is what you've done. You've just enrolled yourself in God's plan of salvation and bringing righteousness to you. If, uh, if everybody here, if you had your way right now and an offer was made to you, that you would never, ever sin ever again. How many of you would take God up on that offer? Say amen. amen. Then bend over. Because that's his plan. Yes. That's his plan. And at some point, Wayne, we decide that we hate sin more yes. than anything else. And if that's what it takes, then so be it. If that's what it takes, then I'll do that. Are you with me? Say amen. Um, and thou shalt not sin. Verse 25. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. You know why your seed's going to be great? Because you're going to raise your kids the way, you were, the, the way God raised you. And thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age like as a shock of corn cometh in his season. Lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know it for thy good. Deuteron Let me just read some verses here. Let me move through the sermon, all right? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. Thou shalt all consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And I want to tell you something, dads. I want to tell you something, children. Your mom and daddy want you to walk in their ways. They want you to walk. God's trying to teach your mom and dad some good things. And I want to say to you young people, don't you ever commit the sin of saying, well, my mom and dad say they want to serve God, but I see what their life is like. And don't you ever commit that sin. Your mom and dad, <clears throat> it may be God's dealing with them. And they're going to turn around and deal with you. God's going to take care of you and he's going to deal with you. So you fear him. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Did you hear that? The son in whom he delighteth. You know what I know about, I knew about all my children? And I loved them dearly, still do. And I delighted in them. Was, I mean, see them do silly things around the house. We want to get it on tape and watch it. And can't wait to show them when they get married what they did. Amen? You got tapes, Courtney. Okay? Got tapes waiting. I know exactly where they are. Um, and I delighted my children, but you know what? I knew they was going to do things that were wrong. That doesn't mean I hated them. Doesn't mean that I wasn't going to love them anymore. So how do you think God's got you figured out? Amen. When he saved you, he knew what to expect. God's been saving people for thousands of years. He's been, God's parented a lot of children. Amen. It's not his first day on the job. And he's had, listen, he's had worse kids than you. He had Paul. He had rebellious children. God had Israel. God's had rebellious children. And he knows what to expect out of them. So don't despise him. When he's taking you around. Here, here's another one. Back behind the woodshed. Amen. When you go back behind the woodshed, Roy, that gets you in, you're in trouble. Amen. 
My mama said that her mama would make them go out in the yard and cut their own switch down. You know what a switch is? It's a long, thin branch. Thin. Okay? Flexible. Won't break. Green. Make them cut it down. If they didn't cut the right one down, they had to go out and cut another one. Got two whippings for that one. Hey, yeah, don't bring, yeah, don't bring the, nothing like that in. But see, that's good parenting. And the world cannot see that. The world is full of pride on how they're letting their kids, children make their own decisions. And it's tearing our country apart. It's ruining our nation. It is, a, it is a smear on the culture of America when we let our children just go and do whatever they want to do. You know what I think is going on in most American homes today? Parents are letting their children do whatever because it, mom and daddy don't feel guilty about what they're doing. They know that child is in that room with that laptop and that high-speed internet looking at God knows what. They know their children are in there doing it, but they can't correct them because they're going to go in their room and do the same thing. In fact, most dads in America now will introduce their sons to alcohol at an earlier and an earlier age. So dad doesn't feel guilty anymore when he goes to the fridge. And they justify, well, I'd rather have them drinking in front of me. (laughs) Mom and daddy goes out and buy their children cigarettes. Goes up and buy their children beer to drink. You think I'm making this up? This is America. It's a smear on our culture to have this going on. Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they're vanity. So don't think that when you got saved, God was expecting great and mighty things out of you. Because he hadn't gotten any so far. He knows your thoughts and their vanity. He knows that you're not going to impress God by what you did. And I'll tell you what, I love that song that Matthew did. and He was worried about it because there was an area of that song that he was kind of iffy about. And he wasn't sure if he was going to make a mistake. And I thought he did well. And I'm, I'm pleased at what he did. And it was what the girl sang over here. I mean, bless my, I'm sitting over there bawling like a baby because I'm hearing, I'm not hearing the mistakes they're making. I'm hearing the, the sweetness of the sound and, and what's in there. I hear that. And I'm pleased at that. So I don't think that my kids have to be perfect in order for me to be satisfied. And neither does God. Perfection comes from God. It is not presented to God. Amen? The Lord... And, and, and by the think about this, okay? Your son or your daughter... And we used to, we used to have a trick, Lindsay. When you, would, when you girls would make pictures... Okay, we'd hang them on the fridge. Okay, don't tell the secret. I can't tell the secret then. Okay, oh no, I can't tell the secret. Okay, just know that they didn't hang up there forever. They're not still there. Okay, they're not still there. But we would take these little pictures that they would make. That was not Leonardo da Vinci's. But that was my child and my child's picture and my child's effort. And I'll take it because I love them. I delight in them. It's that simple. So God was not expecting Matthew to not make one mistake during that song. But he liked it anyway. Because of where his heart is. Amen. God knoweth the thoughts of man that they're vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord. And teaches. How many would like to be blessed? Say amen. Okay. So watch this. You listen to me. He says, blessed, whom the, blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. You might be sitting there today and you have a problem with lying. God says, you want me to teach you how to not lie? Yeah, teach me how to not lie. Bam! And then you lie again, Bradley. Wham! And then you lie a third time. Wham! You know what God's doing? 
He's teaching how, how not to lie. He's got a rod. It's called the Old Testament. And he'll chasten you with that thing. He'll be, you know what? He'll, watch this. Now. I don't know if you've ever done this, Jared. Has your dad ever had to beat you while you're running? Huh? You ever had that one? Dancing. Yeah, dancing all over the house. Watch this. Watch this now. God is going to use his rod and chase you with it to the cross. So he'll beat you even before you're saved. He'll get you with it. Am I right? That's what he'll do. He'll get you before you even, he'll drive you, take that rod and drive you to the cross. That's why I like Old Testament preaching too. Amen. It'll drive us, it's a rod that'll drive us where we're supposed to be. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Let me tell you something. Those of you who God is trying to teach righteousness, we're going to get, we're going to, get to see the wicked of this world thrown into the pit. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. Psalm 118, verse 16. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. Think about this hand. Now, I don't believe you ought to kick your children. That's not punishment. That's me. That's abuse. Okay? I'll kick you. Amen? Listen, you think that's me. I'm just, listen. I'm a man. And us men, we just don't like certain things a certain way. And we just kind of got something in us, Jim, that every now and then we, we kind of think we might ought to take this in our own hands. You know how, what a, back, I had an old deacon one time told me, he said, Mike, he said, when I was growing up, he said, you didn't, you didn't beat your wife. He said, if, if my daddy heard about somebody in the community beating their wife, he said, a bunch of boys from, from the community would go to that man's house, walk in his house and pull him out of his house and lay him out in his yard and stand over him like this. And they say, if you ever hit her again. We'll be back. That was the old America. It worked. I know I'm up here trying to sound tough. But I'm just telling you, you don't kick them. Use your hand. You can control this. The hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore. Did you see what he said? The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over to death. Because God has every right to put you out. Am I right? I'm talking about since you got down at the altar. God has every right in the world to put you out. But he hasn't done it. You know what God decided to do? I know how to take care of this. Wham. And he'll do it. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Think about this now. Think about sheep. And you were in the pen. And there's two gates. And one of them is open to what looks like green pasture. But the devil lied. Because outside waiting behind that grass is a wolf. Okay? And think about this gate over here. Doesn't look like it leads to anything, but standing out there is the shepherd. And so, you know what you're asking God to do? God, close the gate where the wolf is and open to me the gate of righteousness. And God, what is it that a shepherd had in his hand? He had a rod. It was a staff. And the shepherd, when he couldn't lead the sheep, Brady, he would get behind them. That's how the shepherd sometimes has to lead us. Amen. And what did David say about that? The Lord is my shepherd. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Because you know God's trying to get you through the right gate. Let me hear you say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not con be condemned with the world. You know why God's whipping on you? He doesn't want you to burn with the rest of the world. Doesn't want you to do that. Hebrews 12. I'm almost done. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to close it with this. 
Here's why I'm, here's why I'm preaching this. You, you, God, I don't feel like I'm saved anymore. I don't feel like I'm a Christian anymore because I said I'd not do this anymore. And here I am doing it all over again. God says, I got it. I got it. I'll take care of it. You're still saved. I'm not going to let you go to hell. But you need to let me deal with you. Because if you don't, then you're in trouble. If you don't, you're in trouble. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not. He's quoting Job 5. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. You are a son of God if God chastens you. Amen. That means you're going to receive the inheritance of heaven. It wouldn't be worth it. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement. Here it is. Verse 7 right here. King James Bible. If you be without chastisement whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You know what that means? You're not getting anything. You don't get the inheritance. Because you're not a son. If you will. You know how... You, we can pretty much tell who's saved and who isn't, can't we? See, the saved people will get down on their face before God when God's chasing them. And the Holy Ghost just, I mean, just tearing them up. They'll get down on their face before God and say, God, I'm sorry, God, would you help me, God, please? And the rest of the church people sit back there going, wonder what they did. <laughs> well, I like that preaching. That's some of that stuff I just don't care for. I don't have to listen to that. You're not a son. You're not a son. The Bible's got a word for you. I wouldn't call you that. But the Bible's got a word for you. And it is a curse word. Because if you're a bastard, God's not your father. And you'll not get an inheritance. Oh, I say I was eight years old. Down. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what you say. You sit there and act like God's supposed to tear everybody else up and leave you alone. There's something wrong with you. Amen. Furthermore, we at verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. I think you ought to reverence your dad. I think you ought to honor your father. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous. And I can, I can tell some of your pastor who loves you and he cares about you. You can sometimes, I can sometimes tell when the joy has been taken out of you. And I can, it, it always worries me. But I can, I can just kind of tell, I think God's dealing with them. I think God's trying to work on them. I think God's, God's got his rod after them. And in, and in that sense there, I get, I get a little rejoicing as a, as a pastor because I know that God's dealing with you. And if God's not dealing with you, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be like those people sitting at the casino this morning. They don't care. Hey, baby. That, that's what you're going to be. And have no, have no guilty conscience over it whatsoever. That's where the bastards are. But the sons and the daughters of God, he'll take the joy, he'll take the joy away from them and he'll chasten them. And while we're being chastened, we're not, we're not very happy about it. I have never, Brady, I've never yet whipped one of my kids and they come up smiling. Daddy, I love that. Can we do this again sometime? Never happened. Never happened. By the way, I've never been that way with God either. God's had me out to woodshed I don't know how many times. And God knows, listen to me, God knows that he has my permission. But he knows I'm not going to like it. And I don't. So you see me out here sometimes. I'm not all joyous. and It, it may not be my back. It may not be. It may be that God's just got, he's got me. And it's okay. I'm telling you, it's okay to have a pastor that will take the whip every now and then and take the rod. It will make me a better pastor. It already ha I can tell you it already has. It's made me a better preacher. God used a whip to get me here. 
He used a rod to get me to this Bible. And I don't regret it. I don't regret it. We're partakers of His holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It's the fruit of righteousness. You know what I, you know what I hear a lot from, from all three of us, Brady and Bradley and, and myself? We're trying to preach righteousness into these people. And that's good. We keep doing it. But our preaching, I've found out over the years, it does not change men's minds. It does not change their heart. They might say amen and agree with it. And, oh, yeah, that's right. and That's good. But ultimately, it's not our preaching that is changing their heart. We're just telling them this is how we're supposed to live. God is the one responsible for getting us there. And let's not ever forget that as preachers. It's not our job to whip the, the church people. That's God's job. He's the Father. And then we stand back and we watch God bring us and then them to a place of righteousness. So that next time you preach that, Brady, you're going to hear a fresh amen that you didn't used to hear before. You're going to hear somebody say, Amen! And why does that person say amen? Because they used to be on the other side going, I don't like that. And God chastened them over it. And now they're going, amen, that's right. Amen, that's right. Amen, that's right. How do you know God loves you? Probably because of the way you feel right now. It's not joyous. It's grievous. But that's God loving on you. And he's going to bring you to righteousness. And that's where the joy is. Can I hear you say amen? Repent of those sins. And then just wait next time it happens. Just wait for God to come back on you because he will. He's not going to let you get away with it. And you be thankful for that. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. In the solemnity of the hour, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm not going to ask. We're not going to have a bunch of music playing. I'm just going to ask you if, 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 if you need to. If you, if you want God to help you, if you want God to deal with you, or if God is dealing with you, it's okay. And by the way, let me say this. Every now and then, God will use us to be a public example. Just like amongst the brothers and sisters. When Mama went to whip one of the siblings, all the kids knew about it, didn't they? Didn't they? And all of the kids are going, ooh. I'm not doing that. So if God, if God uses you that way, that's, that's cool. That's good. Okay? Let Him do it. So there's no shame in coming to an altar. There's no shame in, in, in just coming down and saying, God, deal with me. God, help me. So right now, if, if God is really laying something on your heart and He's really dealing with you, don't make Him take a rod after you to get you to do it. Just do it voluntarily. And just come down and say, God, deal with me. I, I, I don't want to lose this. God, you deal with me. Anybody want to do that this morning? Let me give you that chance. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believed in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6.23, But the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that, just like our parents used to do, God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life and you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in His Word, and God has never broken His Word, God promised in His Word that He would forgive you and that He would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.